Alors c'est comme au cinéma, d'habitude je suis dans des petites salles et je n'ai pas le droit aux... aux It's like at the movies. Uh, usually, we are in uh, smaller rooms and I don't get uh, such a big stage, uh, so I'm quite glad to be here today. I'm uh, Dorian Marcelin. I'm, a, uh, I'm working for Alliancy, a media that has been following the impacts of uh, the digital world to uh, on the different companies, but also uh, public uh, authorities. So we are discussing cyber security, the human beings and so on. So it's a pleasure for me to be the moderator of this uh, round table today. Uh, we will be focusing on a topic that might not be so easy to understand. Uh, so the, 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 the name in French is Durififi, which means turmoil around European cloud security uh, scheme, the EUCS. Uh, and I have with me a lot of great speakers, and I will try to introduce them uh, quite uh, briefly, but they can, of course, uh, add to what I will be uh, saying. Uh, so I have uh, with me Aude Letelier. Uh, I also have Anna Prudnikova, so team managers security certification at Veritas, uh, at Bureau Veritas, uh, so a world company, global company, very well known, and uh, specifically on certification matters. Uh, you will have a lot to, do, to say about EU CS. We also have with us Xavier Phil, so uh, he is uh, RSSI of Drive, uh, Drive, sorry. Uh, so they are working on um, file hosting, document hosting, but uh, working more specifically on confidentiality. And finally, M Michel Stapman, the Dutch Dig Digital Infrastructure Association uh, director, and he is also representing the Online Trust Coalition, which is a big uh, partnership between the public and private sector, which aims to reinforce uh, the good practices for cloud services to be liable, uh, safe, secure, and build a trust among users. So the EUCS, uh, I have to mention maybe what it is as an introduction, but uh, I think that most of the people in the audience know what it is, but still, a bit of context. Uh, it is certification scheme that uh, is coming after the Cybersecurity Act of 2019. Yeah, so it's strengthened really uh, the uh, uh, European Agency for Cybersecurity, but also promoting the will to certify at a different levels and on the cloud. Um, also to have really a single approach at the European level for certifications uh, and it has to go beyond the uh, national level. So as a journalist, honestly, um, what I've realized is that in 2022, I thought that many things would uh, start uh, being launched, uh, that we would see a lot of initiatives. And honestly, it was not the case. Uh, we've seen a document uh, leaked in May. Uh, it spurred a lot of discussions. Uh, people took the floor in Germany. Uh, we've had different people criticizing the documents. That, there was this rififi in French, a turmoil, if you if you wish. And so, really, this roundtable is there to uh, give you a state of play of the situation and try also. Uh, to start thinking about the future, um, what is coming in the next month, uh, how we will move forward, uh, starting from the uh, actual, uh, current situation. So I will be asking questions in English to some of my uh, speakers. And I, uh, of course, uh, thank them for accepting the French and English session. So I will start in French with Aude Letelier. So NC was really an engine to the to the um, emergence of the EUCS. So could you maybe explain what was your ambition at the beginning and what were the challenges uh, you want this scheme to answer for? Thank you very much. And before uh, I will. Before discussing the EUCS, 
I'd like first to talk about the European uh, certification for security, cyber security, because uh, the French Agency of uh, Cyber Security has been really a, uh, an important factor for that. We were an engine of this. Uh, EUCS is one of the certification scheme, amongst other, but we think and we defended it, we think that we need a European approach to certification to have a better level in Europe. Um, the first element to that is that we think that certification in security has to allow us to really strengthen the different security levels of processes products, services in the European Union to answer certain needs. This appeared with the Cyber Security Act, meaning that uh, there's a mutual agreement to uh, recognize the certification of other countries. And we think this will allow an easier um, access to the EU market for the certified providers. And maybe this uh, scheme will um, promote for the different actors that would want to become uh, certified to do so because they can um, get a return on their investment by accessing the entire European market. Uh, the counterpart to that would be that uh, to that to this uh, uh, new um, exception is that we have to harmonize the practices, standardize the practices in Europe with a different uh, methodology to assess the different levels we want. And in Europe, we have three levels. So first, the elementary level, basic levels for uh, wide uh, audience uh, products, a substantial uh, level that is more targeted to a medium risk product. And then the high level, which is the one uh, raising the turmoil, really, in the uh, EU's ES. And this higher level should be there to cover the solutions that are um, maybe threatened by uh, more sophisticated threats more, or attacks. So this highest level of certification that should be delivered by a public institution should allow us to, in this framework of certification, so the, 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 the public institution is the one assessing uh, the skills necessary to uh, give the certification of the product. So why different levels? Well, because the, the threats are different. We've heard talking about the fact that uh, this is not a, a binary approach. Some things can be put on the cloud very easily. Some other things are not stored on the cloud, and that's it. If I look at the EUCS scheme, well, ANSI, so the French agency, for two years now, has been supporting this position. There are threats known risks related to the exposure of cloud services uh, providers to the third country's law. So if a service provider uh, can be uh, under a, a low conflict, this raises risks for the integrity but also confidentiality of the data hosted. So, of course, our stance, the, the position we've defended starting in 2021, was this one. If we want to have a European scheme with a high-level certification, we have to take into account this risk too. And as a national cybersecurity authority, it would be impossible for us to give certification high-level certification that will answer very sophisticated attacks to providers that will not be able to guarantee to the customers that they will be able to keep 
are really the hand and the data stored on their servers. So we've been working a lot with uh, our partners, such as the European Agency, and we've used our own uh, experience uh, on the requirements, for example, we have in France. And we will have the chance to come back on that later. Thank you very much. Um, so, this raises a lot of discussions uh, around uh, the, the position of France on this topic. And so this gives me the opportunity to talk to Michel. The EUCS is still being discussed um, among the member states and the Netherlands uh, being heavily involved in the search for compromise scenarios. What are the current discussion about on your point of view? And what are the sticking points? I think uh, we have some idea now. Uh, and what do we know about the, the compromise uh, envisaged? So thank you. Uh, I will. Yeah, sure. Microphone, I'm not wired. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Dorian. Um, well, before I answer that, let me first um, explain what we agree on. Because that's a quite a lot. You know, when the, e when <clears throat> the CSA allowed ENISA to develop schemes, we were very enthusiastic, close to ecstatic. Because for the first time, finally, different than, uh, for the GD than the GDPR, we had not f the law, the legal framework, and you go figure it, figure it out, huh? what happens with privacy, no tooling, no certifications, nothing, just a, a piece of legal paper and a lawyer's paradise. And now, finally, we said, okay, we need um, uh, evidence uh, of security that can be used by companies so that they can easily deliver in the entire EU. So um, the EUCS was, uh, was uh, put together by uh, the ANSI Second Cloud Scheme from France, the C5 Scheme from Germany, and from the Netherlands, we added the meta approach um, in the Netherlands in a, in a, a curve called Zeker Online, a short online, which had strong elements from the ISAE 3402, because we, we felt that a certification is not complete if it's not thoroughly audited, and I'm sure Anna will uh, explain about that more. So we thought it has to have value, it has to have evidence, assurance, and, and promise. Um, so that, that happened quickly. I'm uh, representing from DNL, um, uh, let's say, the digital infrastructure of many SMEs that will be uh, by, you know, will have to comply with EUCS. More than a thousand companies, there are many of those. <clears throat> so that was all good news. And then we saw the first draft. And suddenly, how you know how that goes? We said, "Oh, oh so it's, this is not quite the way we expect this to go." Our initial criticism, and we voiced that in a paper from the Online Trust Coalition, OTC is basically uh, uh, Ministry of Economic Affairs, Cybersecurity Center, like you know Dutch ANSI, uh, the, the authorities, our uh, telecom agency, but also CIO platform, many others. And we said, okay, there's, there's a few flaws here um, because for cloud, you know, the idea of three levels, what happens in, in, in for products is very logical. You know, you have different classes of products with different pricing. Doesn't work for cloud because when we asked the constituents, everybody said, what are you going to deliver? They say, well, the best security, of course, that we can deliver because all our customers, you know, want nothing less than the best security they can get. So everybody said, hi, of course. You know, we want high. So the original idea that is the exception to the rule for spe very specific cases was not valid. Secondly, we said, okay, then uh, how does that look high? And we found that level high had f more than 500 controls where a typical framework was only 100. And that's a big job already. So we found it's, much, it's too much rule-based instead of principle-based. It gives companies not enough room to find detailed measures based on what the principle to assure uh, were. And we said, well, if you have good auditing, then you, know, you don't need that many rules because the auditor will do your delegated approval and vetting and inspection of uh, what's in the scheme. And then uh, the third thing came and we found, and this is, I think, the biggest topic because again, on 99% we agree, but then we found that uh, what we believe under a lot of political pressure suddenly uh, some of the provisions from the GDPR were included in five or six lines in the in the high scheme by saying, okay, we have the scrams case, uh, the privacy, the third party transfer, this is something we need to fix. And by the way, we need to improve uh, European sovereignty. Uh, this is a big thing, which we totally agree with, you know, better position for the European market. 
but we felt at the time, well, okay, this is a topic that can fill uh, 20 of these uh, theaters, but not uh, to be decided and determined by ENISA in some back room with five lines of text in a scheme uh, with, with um, options and with rules that nobody can comply with uh, tomorrow, you know, for which migrations need to happen, uh, uh, data loads need to be moved away. This is impossible to achieve in a short amount of time and we're in a hurry. We need a scheme, we want it now. So let's forget about that sovereignty stuff, different discussion, political, parliament, commission, all fine and nice and dandy, and, and maybe up to the uh, EDPD. They can decide about SRAMs and, and uh, whatever, but now we're talking about cybersecurity, about a good scheme, about assurance, we want it now. So let's forget about this stuff and let's move on as fast as we can. That's basically what, uh, as OTC, we wrote uh, a, a paper and the Netherlands came up with the position paper. And I'm sure we're going to talk about uh, how to move next because I believe we need to move on and we need to leave this behind us and then move on in the original goals. Thank you, Michel. Um, Anna, uh, Bureau Veritas has conducted a pilot project to, to assess the certification challenges of, uh, of companies with the UECS. Uh, can you describe this initiative and what were, what were the main findings and conclusions? Yeah, thanks a lot for the question. I guess I will be kind of following up on what Mikhail mentioned because I think that pilot actually followed up after your position paper because it was uh, uh, after the first draft was published. So uh, basically as part of the development uh, process for the certification scheme, uh, ANISA launched this initiative to actually have multiple uh, pilots across different member states. Uh, and in this case, the idea was to kind of simulate, okay, in this version, how can we implement the scheme uh, and try to simulate it with all the potential actors. So basically in the beginning of 2021, BVE participated as part of the Dutch pilot, in this case, actually with Secure Online Scheme. So um, the idea was there were multiple actors. So for example, there was a, a conformity assessment body. So this is BV in this case. Uh, there was also the national uh, certification um, uh, authority, basically who issues certificate in the end, right? And the owner of the scheme. Then um, and certification body, and of course, a couple of uh, cloud security providers. And the idea was to basically see, okay, so those uh, cloud security providers are currently certified based on the sector online. Right, so this is a part of this meta approach that was included in the draft version. And let's see, okay, what are the gaps for those cloud security providers to actually be certified with uh, the European uh, cloud scheme? Because in the end, we also need to incentivize the cloud security providers to be certified. And in the end, if there's, if there's too much effort for them, well, will they actually do that? Because it's not mandatory. Um, well, of course, the main conclusion was uh, that the, the cloud scheme is a really good step, right, you know, to make sure that we are all aligned, because the ultimate goal is to all uh, member states to work together, because right now all the member states have their own schemes. We have in the Netherlands, we have in France, we have C5 in Germany, right? And of course, everybody has the same agenda in mind. Everybody wants to secure clouds, but it puts a lot of pressures on cloud security providers. And of course, if we talk about the big ones, well, for them, they just, well, they have the budget that can be certified by 20 different certification schemes. If you're talking about small cloud security providers, well, they have a limited budget, they need to choose. And of course, in this case, it's always a problem of a choice. And of course, if we say, yeah, there is one scheme, I think that would be a good incentive for them to actually implement cybersecurity because there is an obvious choice. Well, anyway, <laughs> long story short, uh, there were some things that were, um, let's say, interesting and surprising for us when we were uh, checking the scheme. It was not nothing really bad, but of course we understand it was the first draft because we took the draft from December 2020. Um, so three things I'm going to highlight, there were more findings. Uh, so the first one was that some requirements were not really clear, especially when you talk to the cloud service providers who already have certification, they didn't really understand what the requirement meant and how to interpret it. Even though these requirements actually came from some other, like ISO 27K, uh, but because there was no reference directly, it was difficult to understand what it meant. So one of the recommendations that was uh, coming out of the pilot was, okay, you either include this uh, 
text, let's say, from the standard, because the standard does have this guidance, or at least put a link. Okay, if something is not clear, check the uh, ISO 27017 as an example. The second recommendation that came out was the fact that there was uh, a bit of a missing uh, guidance on how to evaluate. So basically there was no clear evaluation methodology. I know this is fixed now, so actually the separate document is being developed to have the evaluation methodology. At that point it was not there. Uh, so also one of the things that we discovered when we were doing uh, evaluation as a conformity assessment body, we didn't really understand, okay, how do we understand if it's correct or not? Because, of course, we were looking at SOC 2 reports and some existing controls and so on. But there was no, um, let's say, criteria. But it was also not really clear how to report. So another recommendation that we provided have the methodology, but also provide the clear reporting templates. In this case, to make sure that everybody, all the conformity assessment bodies report in the same way, meaning that the results are the same. It doesn't really matter is it BV doing it or someone else. And uh, the third, uh, let's say, recommendation that came out, and I think it was the most, let's say, alarming for us, that some of the requirements, they were either contradiction to uh, what cloud service providers have as their functionality in the portfolio, which was not the, the worst one, but one of them actually uh, possessed the potential cybersecurity risk because, uh, an example of that includes the fact that uh, the cloud uh, service providers were mandated to publish information about identified vulnerabilities online in publicly available registers before they have a chance to uh, actually fix them. So imagine you're basically screaming to hackers, look, hackers, we have a vulnerability, welcome. Well, it's not as bad because in the end they did fix that in the new version. This is not a requirement anymore. Um, but overall, for us, it was a really nice experience you know, be part of this uh, wave of raising the cyber res resilience in the European Union, because we really felt that we contributed, we participated, um, and it was a good experience. Thank you, Anne, for your insight. Je vais repasser en français pour. I will switch back to French. And to Xavier, feel you. So you are the representative of the DPO, the CISO, but also of a uh, software editor in France. So you've been following the EUCS for a while now. And as it was uh, mentioned by Anna, it is not only targeted to the major actor, but to everyone. So what is your point of view on this uh, ambition of certifying everyone? What does it represent for you? I'm very interested by this roundtable. Honestly, everything that was said is very interesting. Um, what was said by Eud, Anna, Michel, everything is very interesting. And uh, what Anna just said uh, was so interesting. But what I want to say to Michel, of course, there are specificities of the new framework that we have to deal with. And we need time to really well deal with these different specificities. We might come back on that, but EUCS for uh, sensitive data is fundamental, it's crucial. But for other data, other kind of data, maybe we could use the current system. Uh, I don't know. But uh, I, I would say there's a difference according to the tip, type of data you're dealing with. And I totally agree, we don't want overlapping frameworks. We have uh, RGPD and we have EUCS. There are different things and we shouldn't mix them up, we overlap things, otherwise it would just create more confusion. I totally agree with that and I know that because I have to apply all the regulation. So if regulations are overlapping others, it's very difficult for us. Now, about the cost of communicating about the different incidents and uh, so on, I would say it's rather linked to NIS2. Uh, NIS2 um, might be also integrated in EUCS, and I don't know if it's a good idea or not. Uh, but I will answer the question now in four points. In France, we have sovereign stakeholders that are very important. We have WooDrive, for example, that distribute, publish very good solutions 
in environments and systems that do already respect the sovereignty rule as of today. So this was a requirement from the state. We had to uh, comply with the sovereignty aspect. And we also have what we call cyber campus, so really places where we can have all the leading figures of the uh, cyber intelligence in France. So we've invested a lot. That's what I wanted to say in cyber security in France, but in other countries too. I'm not saying otherwise, but we wanted to make our uh, nation more secure, of course, but we know that there's a power balance in the world, in the digital world, in the hidden also a digital world, cyber criminality. Well, I can tell you that France is aware they have implemented a large budget to fighting cyber criminality. They are also developing solutions and systems to uh, ensure sovereignty. But at the end of the day, it's very difficult for France to have a real weight, a real power at the international level. You also have to assess the added value of these French solutions. So for that, we need to have a strong geopolitical and financial position compared to the other superpower in the world. That's the issue. You have the Chinese, you have the Americans, you have the Russian. They do it with a lot of will. They want a strong infrastructure, a cloud infrastructure that is independent. Let's be honest, when the US are implementing rules, they do not come to us to ask what we think about their regulations. They do it their way, on their side. And they want strong figures in their own countries while Europe is still discussing. At WooDrive, well, for a long time, we have seen an awareness being raised on the sensitivity of data, the most confidential uh, data, and this is thanks in part to the DGPR, uh, the European regulation, and also the 108 convention from last week. And it is really something that is now uh, real for all the sensitive data. And now we talk about cloud de confiance, so a trustworthy cloud. That's how we call it in France. So really, this awareness is now something that is being spread all over the market for the military, for the bank, for the health system. So certification for us, for Udrive and other uh, trusted uh, cloud, we expect it and we want this certification to, to be at the highest level possible. And this is the same for the, the French system. That's a good summary of the situation indeed. And I think this helps me uh, go to one of the conflicting idea. The, the fact of having the possibility to be immune to uh, foreign laws, third countries' laws. This is a question that we've been asking uh, all the time. I know during the plenary too it has been mentioned. So maybe quite quickly, and I know uh, I, I already know more or less what you think about it, but um, could each of you tell me if you think we need this immunity to external law in the EUCS, or if we can just do without it. I'm going to answer, and also maybe to answer about another element which was mentioned by Michel about GDPR. Yes, it's extremely interesting discussion here. I was listening to another roundtable. One of the representatives of our national authority and independent for uh, data protection was there. The way we see the UECS at this high level, at the end of the day, the fact of having this certification 
a high level one is considered by design as being a, a good one for data protection and in compliance with GDPR. We have heard a lot about the overlapping or the intense activity for lawmaking uh, at the European level for the digital issues. So it's the refining, uh, the issue is refining all of this. So at the end of the day, we should not add a heavy layer for the economic level. On the contrary, we should have rules of game, uh, for this game which should be sound. Now coming about immunity, about these uh, safe or sound uh, rules of the game, this criteria show that there is um, fairness. A cloud provider who is not submitted to the to law and not protect data that they receive the way a cloud provider is immune. For us, we cannot give them a visa or a certificate uh, which has the same value. We really believe that they will contribute to have sound rules of the game on the European market. What about the user's point of view? And we have heard about them today and uh, yesterday. It's a matter of trust. We have different associations of users and consumers and also authorities that protect privacy who see that it's interesting for us to have a device or that will allow us to protect the most sensitive data. It's not all the data. Clearly, not all the users will have the means of having a high-level solution of immunity, but to provide the possibility for the ones who wish so and the uh, businesses to just um, have their uh, sensitive data in a trustworthy uh, uh, environment. So a part of the discussions which are not public and we hear about them through the press, they say that there are discussions about different possibilities and scenarios to put this immunity clause in a different way. That is to say, not necessarily ex and exactly on the level, on the different levels, the three levels you discussed, the highest one would be the immunity, but with other ideas. Well, last month there were six possibilities for in, in integrating immunity at different levels. Now, Michel, once again, what do you think about these discussions? About the immunity clause? Discussion and moment. Well, obviously, um, CISOs, so companies using cloud, need to have a choice. That's the idea. So there will be applications where companies say, well, based on my constituents or my customers or my users, I want an absolute guarantee that, um, you know, American authorities uh, have no access to my data, that the Cloud Act is not uh, being used. And that's an option. And the original idea was then, okay, uh, that is then preserved for level high. And if you don't want that, then you can pick level substantial. But that was falsified by the fact that we looked at the market and that everybody said, no, you know, marketing wise, I'm, I have to deliver high, you know, high is high security marketing wise. If you say I only can deliver a data center with substantial or basic security, nobody will ever buy my services. So that means that high will be the norm. And now we get into the fact, okay, is this a one size fits all solution? So is this fixing strengths? Well, there are couple of perspectives to that. If you look at one perspective, look at what's actually happening. Our National Cybersecurity Center did um, uh, a research, uh, a legal research by Greenberg Traurig, 
And they said, okay, um, if you zoom in on the, on the issue, the SRAMs and the access by the Cloud Act and American services, it's much more nuanced than, oh, your data, um, you know, as some people uh, sort of present it, and uh, I've been in the panel a previous week with Max SRAMs, uh, the way he presents it is, oh, you, you give your data to Amazon, that's blind carbon copy American NSA. That's not the case. I mean, even in the US, there are checks and balances. And it's also the case that our intelligence services in France, in the Netherlands, in the UK, also have to entitle themselves to give rights for demanding access to data or even hacking systems if it's in their national interest. So the differences are not that big. And even in the US, there are checks and balances. You get into the discussion, yes, but if Trump comes back and blah, blah, blah. But you see, this is a topic that deserves more attention than saying, oh, this is all cybersecurity. Because in fact, it's a legal requirement. So are you subject to a certain law? And that's not the prime um, area of expertise of auditors who need to look at cybersecurity. They need to protect your infrastructure against hackers and not against lawyers. So this is why we think the INL requirements are a very good topic and important discussion to uh, discuss. And we think it needs to be discussed exactly like um, you both said, in the context of sovereignty, of uh, stimulating the European market, of making sure that Gaia X works, that you know we get stronger players in the in the European market. Uh, but now I would vote okay. So high is the is the norm. That means automatically that we should give um, the option of extension profiles, which is also an option in the EUCS. We can add extension profiles and give customers who really need that immunity can put it in an extension profile and then say, okay, prim, uh, high, high will be the norm, but for some specific cases, we need that extra immunity. And then let's put it in an extension profile that certain companies, if they decide to do that, and if they're willing to pay the extra price, you know, for a, a completely separate setup, uh, because that's what it requires. You need a different data center, you need the technology, you need other parties. You can't Amazon or Google or Microsoft have to deliver the services. Somebody else has to do that. So that setup costs money. And that, uh, so my plea would be, let's, let's forget the difficult discussion. Let's put it in an extension profile. Let's make high the norm and then move with the suggestions as Anna gave with some of the improvements. Let's move on with light speed and let's get the UCS done. It is my next question. Um... Oh, sorry. Is, is, yeah. is, an, uh, is an agreement on UCS is, uh, feasible as early as uh, 2023? I think it is. If there's political will to look at historical interest, because, um, you know, like I said, the Netherlands and France, we're not that far apart, but Europe is EU, that's 28 member states, and of those 28 are nine, you have the digital nine states that have a really strong uh, digital industry who have an, an interest in doing this right. And the Netherlands being a data hub with, with, with all these companies delivering cloud services. I mean, Ubisoft, a French game provider, all their games are hosted by i3D, which is a Dutch player spanning the world. They have a big interest to, to get this right and to move on and to be able to have access to the EU market. So those digital countries, I think they have a bigger vote and they need to be able to understand each other and compromise and find something that works so that we can, can all move on and move to the next step. And what I said at this stage, it's, it's, it's also, um, I don't know if you've seen the, the videos of Bart Groothuis, an MP, a, a member of parliament who was the reporter for the NIS, for the NAS2. And he said, this is very political. This, is a, this immunity stuff is a political discussion. And so we should keep it a political discussion and have solutions and not now, not at this stage and not by ENISA in, in their rooms. We should stick to cybersecurity, to auditing practices, to improving the EUCS, to have it practical, and then move on to the discussion that I think is very important to have. Odd, même question, est-ce que ça vous paraît envisageable du coup? Do you think that with these different points of view to make some progress this year about UCS? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes, this is what we are doing. This is what we wish, just to make this scheme uh, finalized, to finalize it. We have been waiting for a long time. Everybody is looking at us at the European level and, and see we have lots of exchanges 
with uh, our colleagues and they are going to go on doing this with our colleagues to reach an agreement. Maybe about the security criteria, sorry, about the immunity uh, criteria, maybe two elements that you mentioned, Michel. These criteria, we talk about technical measures. They do include, they do include legal criteria. These are not political criteria for us. We know that there is a risk as a matter of confidentiality, availability of the data, and not taking them into consideration would mean that you are going to deliver certificates. As Anna said it, that is to say to, as, as a national authority, this is really difficult for us. We believe that when we talk immunity about immunity, we want to solve the law conflict. It's different from sovereignty. Sovereignty, the state needs to protect its own needs for its sovereignty. This is one element. Economy will also will need to protect one part of the most sensitive data, that is to say these non-legitimate access, which are not a, a, a dream or a, yes, there are different cases. So we want to make some progress. We, want, we don't want to leave this topic aside. We don't want this product to go on its own. What could be the, the consequences for Bureau Veritas as a, as a company uh, if uh, UCS uh, uh, advance and, and, move, and we move on, like uh, Michel said? Uh, what are your, your objectives and, and business challenges? <laughs> uh, yeah, one of the things I wanted probably to start with, uh, that was a bit alarming what Miguel said, that, you know, uh, people still see certification as just a stamp. So like, let's say, oh, I'm going to have high, not because I want to have good cybersecurity, but because I want to have stamp and I want to have, you know, marketing. Uh, but important aspect to see here, uh, also we at BV, we are not just a certification body, right? We have a, a cybersecurity expertise center. So we are there to support all the companies through the whole journey, because in the end, the high cyber resilience is a journey and the cybersecurity certification is just a stamp in the end. But the important part is how you actually get there. And this is where uh, we believe we can bring the most value, right? So, uh, and okay, we still, now we have a better, let's say cybersecurity culture uh, in European Union, but why also? Because all of this needs to is coming here, uh, Cybersecurity Act, right? So companies are doing there maybe for the sake of having this kind of a stamp and being certified, but that actually in the end does raise the cybersecurity culture overall. And that's a good shift. Uh, and you know that will allow us all to uh, address the cybersecurity threats in a better way. Uh, and that's for the upcoming um, well, cloud scheme. Uh, we at BB already have a lot of different accreditations. So of course we aim to be one of the first certification body to be able to issue the certificates, but also to support the companies to get to the certification. Well, luckily for us, uh, due to the fact that we've been uh, doing a uh, different type of certification, safety and cybersecurity, uh, it's not going to be too challenging to add another one because also as part of the pilot, we saw what are the requirements for uh, the comfort assessment bodies, but also for the certification body. Of course, there will be some additional things that we need to make sure that we implement, but in the end for us, the transition will be smooth. I think my message in this case, uh, that we really hope that in maybe five, 10 years from now, people will stop seeing certifications as just a stamp, but actually as a journey to reach better cybersecurity. Xavier, finalement, la même question. Uh, the same question for you. If we think the EUCS to make some progress rapidly by the end of this year, so we can unblock the situation, what are your prospects? You were talking about an economic benefit. 
just to be present in the European market, and somebody else also talked about this. So, once we are going to have this UCS, what will happen? What, what does it represent for you? We have already made this exercise to participate in a public consultation for the benchmark, you know, for the um, healthcare, uh, and also for the cloud. So th the healthcare data are extremely sensitive, extremely sensitive. So I would like to say something, okay? So we take care of very sensitive data. The data of our customers who ask for having a very high level of cybersecurity as a partner of cloud, of trust, worthy cloud. It's very important. It's not everything. It's a part of the information system which can, which is not going to be uh, part of the EUCS. So we have already done the exercise and therefore we believe that in order to protect the data of the European citizen, this label is for the structures which are not submitted to uh, foreign laws. So we believe that this is a good orientation and we want EUCS to take this direction within the next month. We do realize this very opportunity to reinforce of this European cybersecurity scheme. Maybe, and this is a challenge, should we unlearn for the management and storage of the most sensitive data the dependency on the US tools? And for your information, I say it, the highest level of UCS aims at protecting, first of all, the strategic data and sensitive data, personal, not personal, for example, intellectual property, know-how, strategy of the contracts. Yes, we don't want them to be in the United States. Secondly, the administration and governmental services, the uh, uh, health care, the secrets of the nation, and critical missions. This is my answer. For the importance of having a high level of um, cybersecurity for this sensitive data. The fact of having this experience, it's a fast track on EUCS in order not to start everything from scratch. For this cloud, we want to aim at of the sovereignty strategy. The nation asked us to do so. We are not the only ones in France uh, who have sovereignty tools, I think, across the world. This is the case. In Spain, in Italy, they have the sovereignty aims. So this is our aim, this sovereignty objective. We did our best to answer to the 400 uh, requirements of the... And now we are going to go to the European sovereignty stage because it's also a prospect for us to open our market, not at the national scale, but to open our market at the European level. So for us, this is a wonderful way of expansion, of growth beyond, far beyond the limits that we could give to this new UCS. For us, it's really a beautiful opportunity. If we imagine EUCS, what are going to be the consequences of the SEC cloud? The principle of the European framework is that as soon as we have a European scheme, the national certifications are going to stop. 
Everything that I have been talking about uh, till now, all the elements you have mentioned, the issue at stake is to develop this mutual recognition on basis of shared criteria, agreed criteria among us. And then, for example, a business can enter into the Netherlands, Spain, Italy, on the basis of a French certificate. And also for a certified business in the Netherlands, they can provide services to France. This is the principle. And, of course, we have transition modalities that have to be defined. And I'm sure that all of the uh, entities that have these um, schemes will work in order to clarify these transition stages as soon as we have a copy, Michel, a proper uh, draft of this EUCS. Michel? Can we imagine a, a rapid certification of, uh, of members of the Dutch Digital Infrastructure Association? Um, and what are their pressing matters to, to have the, this rapid certification if EUCS? Uh, yes. I think um, it, it will not be a major step. That, so I agree with, uh, with Anna's findings. Uh, it's also with our constituents. As long as companies have been delivering hosting and cloud, uh, as you, Xavier, pointed out very well, uh, security has been top of mind. And the discussion confirms that we need the best possible security and protection for sensible data. So we agree on the fact that it's going to be the best that we can get. That will be the market norm. Most companies had that in their genes for a long time. So yes, of course, from a marketing perspective, their sales want a rubber stamp. But if you look in practice, then pretty much all these companies already have that security culture. This is why we had over the last 20 years, no enormous accidents in cloud services, despite the fact that everything is, to, is today in the cloud. You know, it's vulnerable to the whole world and no big disasters happen. So something must be reasonably right. And that means that we expect that certification will be a fast process, but not with INL. Because what happens if uh, in the Netherlands, you know, in France it may be different, you have Segnum Cloud and many companies may ha have already set up on-premise type of private clouds or moved away from, uh, from big tech. In the Netherlands, there is a large ecosystem where Azure, Amazon services, Google, Clouds are integral part. Everybody uses Azure AD or some hybrid solution or SaaS solutions in which these uh, tech giants have a place. They have a market share, not for nothing, and that's not because they're to blame. It's the fact that pretty much every company apparently chose solutions in which the, the big tech um, uh, cloud services were sort of embedded and ingrained. And you can't sort of switch that off overnight. You can't say, I want a certificate. Oh, I'm going to move away from Microsoft and move to whatever Azure is provided by somebody else. You know, and make a huge migration cost where the security in itself, so the cybersecurity doesn't improve, but you're void of access by uh, the American legal service. So we say that effort, the enormous migration costs to do away with those are, in, are disproportional to what we want to achieve. We want the highest security. And, and, and then, so again, my plea, let's move on very quickly. Companies will very quickly um, be able to certify. And then let's discuss what the best option and place is for sovereignty, for immunity to uh, uh, US legal uh, requirements, for uh, a better position of European companies, for a smaller market share, of Google and Amazon and Microsoft and a bigger market share of Lease Web, i3D, Ubisoft, uh, OVS Cloud, and those companies, those those chances. So that, that was my plea. The second and last point is to Anna in the Online Trust Coalition, we identified standard schemes, standard auditing, which was added from Zeker Online, and also the standard reporting. Very important point. And we believe that if the, the reporting, so the, uh, the, the example, the, the assurance reports are there, which is still uh, sort of a gap in Europe, then also authorities can reuse it because the, the privacy authority 
has now its own mandate to look at, is it secure? And what we hope for is in future that they're going to say, oh, this US US has so much value. Um, I'm looking at privacy aspects, but for the security aspect of privacy, I don't have to look myself. I can simply trust the report that's provided by, you know, companies like Veritas based on the EU CS. And that will substantially decrease the audit cost and compliance cost for company and will give them an advantage on the European market. So on that point, we, I think we totally agree, but there's some small details that we have to sort of rub away still in our discussions. Alors, on s'approche de, de la fin de cette table ronde. Je voulais quand même... We are getting close to the end of our round table. I don't know if somebody in the room has a question. We still have a few minutes. So please do not hesitate. If you have a question in the room, we can give you a microphone. Yes. Uh, we are going to give you a microphone. Maybe you can come. Uh, hello, sorry. I'm the digital director of MEDEF. I would like to ask a question to Ms. Letelier and to the person of Veritas. Is it possible? Concretely speaking, to guarantee a full immunity, do you guarantee that in your product, no service provider, no element, which in one way or another, which would be attached to the USA, there has been no product, no transaction in dollars, no intervention of a service provider, to what extent can we guarantee this full immunity? My neighbor says that he would like to make a comment. Sorry, my name is not old, but since we are Seknem Cloud, we want to have this sovereignty. It's not only a matter of marketing. We only use French solutions. And I can tell you that you can look at it on uh, the internet. So it's against the background of the Seknem Cloud. Uh, it's not for all of our services. We have other services where we can use the US systems but it's totally uh, in silos. I can tell you that Secnum Cloud already imposes on us limitations that and we cannot go beyond these limits. It's going to be the same for the UCS. Have I answered your question? I would like to add something else, if I may. Presently, we have some 10 assessment uh, process for the Seknem Cloud at the national level. Of course, you have some businesses like Udrive that have invested in this profession, in this business of high level cybersecurity. And we also have seen, and maybe we can answer Michel different initiatives, which are called hybrid initiatives. We are really convinced that this is not the issue that we have, and we must stop using these digital tools uh, provided by U.S. businesses. This is not the issue at stake. The hybrid initiatives that we have seen they are natural candidates for our Secnum Cloud certification. And we work also with them to see how and whether the technical and organizational and legal criteria are robust enough. And our conclusion right now is that not only it's feasible, but it is but the different uh, businesses, and for example, the US ones, are in an approach where they want also to enter the European 
market for uh, just embarking the uh, sensitive data. So we are reassured of this uh, to see this initiative. We are going to go on working with all the businesses and consortium that will come and introduce our project, their project. On, on this subject, do you want to add something? Uh, alors. On a atteint la, la, la fin. So this is uh, <coughs> the end of the schedule, um, so thank you for your attention. But our speakers are still here. If you have any questions, don't hesitate. Uh, you can even come to them and uh, ask them a question directly before they leave. I would like to thank you all and uh, thank my uh, three guest speakers because it was a very comprehensive presentation. I think uh, we can applaud them.